Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Well, friends, I have found it. The most immaculate, stunningly perfect, created in a lab example of woke capital masking a completely odious, anti-worker, regressive agenda. You ready for this? So, there is a new union effort over at REI in New York City. Workers attracted to the company, presumably for their progressive language and supposedly progressive values, well, they've decided they want the retailer to actually try to live up to those values. What's more, REI is not just a nominally progressive company, but it's actually structured like a co-op, which you would think would indicate some kind of corporate commitment to democratic values in the workplace. So, did REI welcome this new union effort with open arms? Of course not. Not only are they rejecting it, but they are doing so in the most hilariously revealing way. The company recently released a podcast for their workers in order to unleash a typical torrent of union-busting propaganda, but they put a really special spin on it, prefacing their union-busting with a theatrical woke dance in an attempt to disguise their terrible agenda. Here's how it begins. Hi, REI. My name is Wilma Wallace, and I serve as your Chief Diversity and Social Impact Officer. I use she, her pronouns, and am speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Ohlone people. So I'm here chatting with Eric Arts, who serves. Wilma then introduces her guest, REI CEO Eric Arts, who also provides his pronouns and does his indigenous lands acknowledgement before smoothly transitioning into his anti-union talking points. We don't believe, I do not believe, that introducing a union is the right thing for REI. And more specifically, I believe the presence of union representation will impact our ability to communicate and work directly with our employees and resolve concerns at the speed the world is moving. And that is the core of why we don't think that introducing a union is the right thing for our employees. So Wilma, allow me to unpack this. Now friends. I have seen and heard that same anti-union propaganda <laughs> approximately a million times, which just goes to show you whatever political sheen, whatever gloss a company decides to paint on themselves, with very few exceptions, every one of them is ultimately committed to the same things, money and control. But the prize for woke union busting this week has got to go to Starbucks. We've been tracking the wildfire of Starbucks unionization efforts spreading across the entire country, and it's truly the worst nightmare for the corporate bosses who run that company. Their initial strategies from Buffalo pushed the edge of legality, but were insufficient to stop two stores there from unionizing. Now, faced with a deluge of dozens of stores petitioning for unions, Starbucks has decided to veer straight into the most aggressive and illegal tactics possible. Specifically, Starbucks has fired seven workers, nearly the entire organizing committee, at a store in Memphis, Tennessee. Those seven workers actually represent more than a third of the entire workforce at that store. One of the fired workers explained, quote, I was fired by Starbucks today for quote unquote policies that I've never heard of before and that I've never been written up about before. Starbucks Workers United added that many of these workers had no prior offenses, no prior write-ups whatsoever. The union has filed a complaint with the NLRB alleging Starbucks, alleging that Starbucks's actions were illegal. Starbucks, of course, denies that. Now, this sounds exactly like the playbook that Amazon has run to halt union drives in its warehouses, things like firing organizers Christian Smalls and Daquan Smith, and inventing BS rationales for why those workers were let go. The sad thing is that these moves are common, and they're often successful. The NLRB has limited tools to deal with this kind of lawlessness, and disputes over firings can drag out for years, long past the time when any remedy would actually matter for the union drive at hand. And that's why these tactics are employed so routinely. The Economic Policy Institute found that companies are charged with breaking the law in 41.5% of union elections, and that companies were charged with illegal firings in nearly one-third of NLRB-supervised union elections. Contrast these illegal regressive firings with the language and the posturing on Starbucks' website. Their most recent blog post there, written by the company's chief diversity officer, recounts the horrors of Jim Crow segregation and includes these words apparently written unironically, quote, like many black, indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, were encouraged to dream big and then were taught to keep those dreams to ourselves out of fear that someone might question our desire for more, our desire for true freedom and autonomy. 
Tell me more about your quest for freedom and autonomy as you woke wash for a company that will casually fire its workers if they dare to push for any freedom and autonomy for themselves. This weaponization of wokeism for aggressive ends, though, it's not just the domain of corporate America. Their protectors and their cronies use the exact same tactics to great and disastrous effects. There's a particularly dangerous battle unfolding over who's going to occupy Stephen Breyer's seat on the Supreme Court, and it follows the woke capital playbook to a T. As we reported before, James Clyburn is aggressively pushing federal district judge Michelle Childs for that spot. She meets the Biden administration's arbitrary demographic test, and that alone is supposed to convince us that she would be a progressive addition to the court who might rule in ways that benefit the disproportionately black working class. But at every turn, she has instead worked in service of her class, exposing the real dividing line in politics. She worked for years as a management side labor attorney at a famed union busting law firm. She won support of Republicans like Lindsey Graham and corporate Democrats like Jim Clyburn by fighting for corporations to kill claims of discrimination and civil rights violations, a commitment that she continued while she was on the bench as a judge. Woke capital has so perverted our discourse, though, that just by dint of her identity, it would be extremely difficult even for supposed progressives in the Senate to vote against her confirmation. A large swath of the public and certainly our elected leaders can't see that the important difference between SCOTUS members isn't their gender or race, but how fervently they serve corporate power. Even Senator Sherrod Brown, a reliable pro-union vote in the Senate, has been pushed into backing Childs. As he told Politico, quote, If she is chosen, I'll be enthusiastic. I've heard things. I am reassured from Clyburn and others that she would be a good nominee. Outside progressive groups have mostly greeted Childs' potential nomination with a shrug. One told Politico, quote, that those groups were not interested in creating a problem for Biden on this. So your commitment is to the comfort and ease of the most powerful person on the planet. What about the problem that Childs could create for the working class and marginalized people you pretend to give a damn about? Just ask yourself this. How could a president who promised to be the most pro-union president in history even consider such a person? Woke corporate identity politics are the reason. Hollow identity politics. These efforts are why I have come to see the fetishization of language and ineffective anti-racist trainings that focus on individual racist sin rather than institutional harm as not just empty, but extremely destructive. It is no exaggeration to say that the people most committed to this direction are the most direct and most potent obstacles to actual change. Because the entire ideology says that racism is an immutable sin at the founding of the country that we can never hope to eradicate. The implication is that rather than fighting its effects through union efforts and institutional change, we should instead focus on individuals, on personal demonstrations of anti-racism of the kind that corporations are only too happy to employ. Or we should focus on individual diversity projects that swap out some white male elites for some maybe black female ones. These projects provide something that sort of looks and feels like maybe it's change, but is in reality just a further entrenchment of existing power. Barack Obama's hope and change message, coupled with an administration that was stuffed to the gills with Wall Street lackeys, that provided the roadmap for every woke corporatist who followed. You get the money, and you get the elite status, and you get to wrap yourself in virtue. It is a great deal for those who benefit from the existing system and aren't, say, looking to make rent and join a union. And you can use your pronouns and your diversity language to turn around and accuse anyone who objects of being a racist or a sexist or a transphobe. We must understand this ideology and the people pushing it as an enemy to be defeated because it is as big a reason as absolutely any that exists in the world that this country remains so miserable for so many people of every color and creed. And I just looked at these three stories, the REI thing, Uh Starbucks, Think of the language they use on their website. Think of what their supposed commitments are. And they fire seven workers because they dare union organize to work organize them. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.